Okay, well, um, thank you. When uh, when Jeff asked me to talk about Star Car at this conference, I did point out that it wasn't actually submerged under the North Sea. Um, but as you can see from this map, it is very close to the North Sea. And albeit not underwater, the site is submerged under a thick bed of peat. And by removing this peat, um, we, we reveal a buried landscape which has informed us hugely about how people were living 11,000 years ago. And indeed, the site has um, been used on several television programmes uh, about Doggerland to illustrate what life might have been like at this time. So in this talk, I'm going to take you through some of the our more uh, significant discoveries and also think about the site within the wider context, all of which might help us think about what we might find beneath the North Sea in terms of the archaeology. So there's been a, a punctuated history of research at the site, starting with the discovery by local amateur archaeologist John Moore, the famous excavations by Graham Clark, further work by the Vale of Pickering Research Trust, and finally, uh, over 10 years of um, excavation work by, uh, by me and my co-directors, Chantal Canella and Barry Taylor. The excavations by Clark can be seen here, a number of long trenches with extraordinary preservation, his students are cleaning wood within the peat, um, and this one sort of also shows the depth of the peat, as does as does this one. And if you if you look at the right hand corner, you can just see a, a cow right at the top of the trench, um, which helps for scale a bit on this one. A wealth of wonderful and rare objects were uncovered during these excavations, which undoubtedly made the, the site famous. Um, in the archaeological world. 21 of the antler frontlets were found. Um, these are the only ones known in Britain. And 191 barbed points, which is well over 90% uh, of all barbed points known in Britain as well. All of these finds and more were concentrated um, in the main part of the excavated area. And this is a plan of the flints by square yard, showing the concentrations uh, dramatically decreasing towards the edges. And this is basically why Clark thought he'd excavated the whole site. Several decades later, the Vale of Pickering Research Trust excavated a trench um, to conduct paleoenvironmental analysis. Um, the trench was about 25 metres from Clark's trench placed far away to avoid the archaeology. However, of course, um, as you uh, might have guessed, there's plenty of archaeology in this trench, including flint, uh, bone, antler, and most intriguingly, um, this wood right at the, the, the far end of the trench, which had been split and hewn, and was thought to be the earliest evidence of systematic carpentry in Europe. However, no further work was carried out and it was unclear whether this was maybe some sort of platform or perhaps a trackway. From 2004, um, Chantal, Barry and I directed further excavations at the site. Um, and in the first phase, we conducted field walking, uh, test pitting and dug a large trench on the dry land, which is, um, hopefully you can see my, my cursor here, but this one um, in red SC23. And this is Clark's trench just to the side of it, um, which shows uh, the, the, the scale here. The whole, the, the area where we've got the, um, uh, the, the hashed area is um, uh, all the field walking um, and uh, the test pitting that was done, which shows the extent of the site. And basically what we can see here is that overall, we've dug less than 5% of the site. Um, and just to give you a, scale, a sense of scale of this area, if you, if you take this peninsular area here with all these test pits down it, this is what it looks like actually in the field. So it's a very large uh, field um, full of Mesolithic archaeology. In the second phase of our field work, we, we, we received um, Historic England and ERC funding for the post-glacial post project to conduct a large scale excavation at Star Car and also other investigations around the lake. Uh, so SC23 is our dry land trench, which we excavated previously in, in 2007, 2008. Um, and the excavations in 2013 to 15 basically filled in this area between 
Clark's Trench and this Dryland Trench. And also we have the trench um, BP85A, um, this, this one right down here, which is the, the trench from the 1980s. Um, so the idea behind this was to, to get a, a, a better understanding of, and of occupation and activity areas across one area. And again, here's a kite shot to give you a sense of scale again. So um, the tent is in Clark's uh, area here. This green patch to the, the right um, is where SC23 um, and a, a structure uh, on the dry land was found. And as you can see from um, a number of these, these photos, uh, the excavation spanned both the waterlogged uh, PT areas, which are the much darker brown areas, and um, the dry land areas, which are the light grey areas in these slides. Um, this slide, I think, really clearly shows that slope down from the dry land to the water's edge, the darker peat, which is where the, the water would have been. And indeed, you can see that there's water pooling in areas um, uh, here now. And this is what I meant at the beginning about peeling back the peat to reveal this buried land surface, which um, helps you envisage how people were living um, in this landscape at that time. So what did we find? Um, well, on the dry land, we found evidence of at least three structures, if not four. Um, this is a, a plan of the, the central structure. Uh, it's, it's fairly ephemeral um, and it had been truncated by earlier excavations. It would have been a, a complete circle, not a, a half circle there, but that's the, that's the sunken middle part of it, which had been um, dug out and it's surrounded by uh, post holes. And you can also see that there are these other sort of semicircles of post holes around as well, which may be um, other uh, uh, features, uh, other structures as well. And then in the waterlogged part of the site, um, what would have been the edge of the lake, um, we had the opportunity to further investigate the platform found in 1985. Um, here we can see it as a, a blank rectangle in this, this um, map. Um, and not only were we able to better understand that platform, but we found two others and a further massive scatter of wood. Um, and finally, we were also amazed to find a bit of Clark's um, excavated area uh, still intact, this bulk which hadn't been excavated. So thanks to an incredible dating program by Alex Bayliss, funded by Historic England, we were able to analyze 223 dates from the site, um, some of them historic dates as well, um, demonstrating that the site was used for over 800 years. And this has helped develop a picture of how the site has changed across time and space. And I'm going to give you a very quick run through uh, some of this now. So we start with this detrital wood scatter, as we call it, um, the earliest dated part of the occupation from about 9,300 BC. Um, and this appears to be the earliest date um, for Mesolithic occupation in Britain, actually. So about three centuries after the beginning of the Holocene. I think there was a, a question about this yesterday. And this is what it looked like on the ground, um, a mess of both worked wood which had been split um, and some natural pieces of wood as well. Uh, there was some animal bone within it um, but not a huge amount but what was really intriguing was uh, this particular grouping here. These are the bones of a red deer and when excavating on site we thought that perhaps we had um, a deer who'd died or had been deposited in the lake uh, but on analysis in the lab Becky Knight our zoo archaeologist realized that this deer actually had two left back legs. Now, obviously two left, two left legs is uh, not um, normal or even uh, possible. So there are a range of explanations for this. Um, perhaps people had de deposited um, limbs and other bits of red deer into this area to reconstruct a deer body. And you can also see that um, there's no head bones, but there is a frontlet uh, very close to um, this collection of bones. What's also very interesting in this area is this elk skull which was found um, and this provides us with uh, some of the earliest uh, dating for the site which bears some re resemblance to the site of uh, Lundby Mose in Denmark 
where elk bones and an elk antler mattock were found, again, very early on in the Holocene. Moving on, um, we have the first of the three uh, timber platforms. Um, the central platform constructed in the middle of the 90th century uh, Cal BC after the end of the detrital wood scatter. And this was composed of three layers of timbers. Um, some were split, some were tree trunks. Um, and this had been appeared to have been used for um, several generations before being covered by peat. Now, very little has been found on any of these platforms, um, but we get the, um, the odd uh, the odd artifact um, or, or piece of bone. And here we've got a collection of lithics, which have been used for animal processing and um, perhaps had even been kept in a bag, which has since deteriorated. Um, but the questions are, you know, were they, were they lost? Um, had they been discarded? Or was this actually some kind of special deposition? Um, then later on, we see the, the Eastern platform this, um, we couldn't get so many dates from this one, but it does seem to be likely that it was constructed after the central platform. And here you can see it from above. Um, you can see the, the, the scale of it. Um, it's, it's quite huge. It's very close to the central platform, which is, that's the remnants of that one there. And you can also see how a trench, which we put in in 2006, missed this platform by literally 50 centimetres. Uh, and I would say that this is the uh, advantage of doing large scale excavations, open area excavations. Um, so you don't miss things when you put in smaller trenches. The Eastern and Western uh, structures on the dry land, um, which you can see here have been highlighted by the burnt flints, the red dots around them. Um, these appear to date to around 8,800 BC, although there is a possibility that they, they could date um, earlier. And uh, at a similar point in time, we were able to um, excavate the, uh, the Clark's, platform, uh, Clark's area, which, which dates to about that, that same period. So here it is just um, in, in plan. Um, and you can see just how densely packed this was uh, with fines. Um, this is a, a, a close up uh, showing the incredible richness um, and, and, and just the way in which it's, it's jam packed with wood, bone, antler, and so on. Now, very interesting from the dates again, it looks like this is, um, as I say, this is contemporary with the dry land structures, but it also could have been accumulated in anything as short as. Um, perhaps just one year, um, although it might have been longer, it might have been a, a generation or so. And here's another photo of the incredible richness and density of that material. We haven't found anything else like this on this site or indeed others in the area. Um, and within that, we found a, a, number of, uh, a number of more frontlets. Altogether on our excavations, we found 12 more antler frontlets. Slightly further to the south of this area, um, we found this incredible pendant, only uh, the size of a guitar plectrum. I mean, very small, very thin, very fragile, and engraved with these mysterious lines. And then in terms of uh, wooden artifacts in this area, we also found a bow, a number of digging sticks, and a sort of uh, wooden platter. It's quite difficult to know what it is, but it looks like just a, a large um, wooden carved um, piece. And finally, we move to the Western platform, which is very close by Clark's area, which was built two or, um, two or three generations after the Eastern platform. Um, and after this, there are some further um, evidence of occupation, but it is very ephemeral and it's lot, not long uh, before the site really appears to go out of use. Uh, and here is the um, that Western platform as well, again, um, just, so you, you get a sense of that. It's incredible to, to think that the site was used in this way for 800 years. Um, and from macrofossil data, Barry Taylor was also able to construct the environmental picture, which shows a change in, in the local environment um, from fairly open water um, in zone one here 
to uh, more ferns and fen plants um, and an encroaching of, of reeds around the lake edge in zone two, to um, in zone three, um, much reduced open water um, and um, much more of a, a fen landscape. In addition, we worked with uh, Simon Blockley and his team from Royal Holloway and the, the University of Southampton to core the lake sediments and use a range of proxy data to build up a picture of the environment and climate over the period of occupation. And what we were able to show is that people live through an abrupt climate event, very similar to uh, that that would have been experienced in the 8.2 event. And yet the activities on site appear to remain largely unchanged. They were still building platforms, um, still had the same sort of artifacts and so on, still were, were there. Um, suggesting that these people were resilient to this abrupt climatic event. But our research goes uh, beyond star cards, the wider landscape, and this is the Vale of Pickering today. There's no lake, uh, the, the peat has developed over the millennia and uh, some, a submerged landscape lies beneath um, these, these lovely green fields. However, thanks to the, the vision of Tim Shadler Hall, who's in this photo, but with his back towards us, um, and decades of research of auguring through this peat, we have been able to map the contours of the ancient lake. Um, it's about four uh, kilometers east to west and two kilometers north to south with several islands uh, in, the, in the middle of it. And furthermore, through digging test pits and um, doing these at a, around 15 uh, meter intervals around what would have been the lake edge, it's been possible to map further sites around the shoreline, some of which are Mesolithic, but some of which are also late Paleolithic. And this map shows just some of those sites we now know of over 25. Um, at the same time as digging at Star Car, we also undertook some excavations at Flixton Island here. You can see it's just a couple of fields along from Star Car. Um, and this was another site that was originally found by John Moore, the local amateur archeologist um, who discovered Star Car. So here's a, a kite shot of these excavations. Um, we, we were down at the lake edge and also on the top of the island um, again. And here we uncovered more of uh, John Moore's site and realized it was a long blade site. We didn't actually find much flint at all, but what we did find was the remains of a large number of horses which have been butchered on the edge of the lake. This is a very rare find indeed uh, for a site of this period. And we're currently working on the dating with Alex Bayliss and hope to be able to resolve whether this site actually dates to the very start of the Holocene or, or whether it's a, um, a bit earlier. What was also uh, very nice about this site um, was that it also produced a large number of horse hoof prints in the lake muds. So overall, this is a really rich landscape, archaeological landscape, telling um, a story of activities from the, the late Paleolithic through to the Mesolithic. It's remarkable how people use this landscape and some sites for centuries and how they appear to be relatively settled um, at a number of these locations. But although uh, we feel we know a lot more about it, as ever, the archaeology has thrown up many more questions and there is still so much to learn from this landscape and indeed the one um, under the North Sea, which is um, very nearby. And if we return briefly to the North Sea and think about Star Car in that context, we can reflect on how many of the things that we found at Star Car have clear parallels with other countries in Northwest Europe. For instance, we've got that elk which was deposited um, in the lake, um, just as um, the elk deposited in, in Denmark. We've also got uh, the pendant and we have an amber pendant that was found by Clark with clear parallels to amber pendants and the kind of geometric uh, artwork found in Denmark. And of course, um, we've got the antler frontlets with clear parallels to a number of sites in Germany. The exciting research on Doggerland that we've all heard about over the last couple of days has enabled us to begin to think about how this fits together um, and how connections across Doggerland might have happened. I'm going to actually just end um, with a short film made by Marcus Abbott, um, which hopefully takes you back in time to what things might have looked like more than uh, 11,000 years ago.
So I'll just read out the, the subtitles here, but Starkar is a Mesolithic site on the edge of a prehistoric lake. The people at Starkar place timbers in the shallow water. People also placed artifacts in the water, like this antler headdress. In one area of the site, there was an extraordinary accumulation of artifacts. This consisted of thousands of pieces of bone, flint, antler and beads, and included many more headdresses. Evidence shows people lived at the site for around 800 years. Over the generations, people built platforms by the lake edge. So I hope that that gives you um, a little sense of uh, how we imagine Star Car and that that landscape uh, to to have looked um, all that time ago, and perhaps how we might imagine um, Doggerland as well uh, to have looked. But um, hopefully we can we can think about um, creating further reconstructions um, and so on in the in the future. I'll just end by saying that if you'd like to know more about our excavations at Star Car, our two monographs are available for free uh, from the White Rose Press. And we also have further information on our website. So finally, um, a big thank you to um, my co-directors, Chantal Canella and Barry Taylor, the 70 plus staff and specialists who worked with us over the, the, the period and uh, over 400 volunteers who worked on site um, and everyone who supported the project and of course our funders. And finally, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nikki. I mean, what beautiful archaeology. I totally love those horse prints and they are, um, they're fabulous. Um, we do have some questions in and we have a couple of minutes for questions as well. So, um, oh, they're coming in thick and fast. That means they're moving. <laughs> um, so the first one came when you were talking about the flints and it's from John Adams who asked, what was the purpose of burning flints? Um, I think, well, uh, Ch Chantal Canella, who's our um, flint expert, can probably talk more about this than, than I can. But um, I, I mean, I think some of the flint is is accidentally burnt, which is why um, there, 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 we don't have very clear evidence for hards, but there is a lot of burning within the structures or around the structures, and particularly around the Western structures, there's a lot of burning. And so um, it is more likely to be accidental than um, purposeful. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Susan Biddle, who um, is asking what many people I think might have been thinking, which is, is the arrangement of wood in the platforms at Star Car similar to the wooden benches at Boldner Cliff? Um, well, I think probably Gary can um, answer that better than uh, than I can, um, knowing those better. But uh, I mean, I, I I don't I don't think they're they're quite the same, but um, I mean, Gary, is Gary still here? Gary, do, do you have a view on this? It looks like he's here. It looks like he's here. Well, maybe. Um, well, maybe that's a discussion that might be held later. Mm -hmm. but, I think, uh, I mean, the, the advantage for us is that we, we were able to, 
clear them very clearly. And I think that, the, I mean, each of the platforms are slightly different, particularly the central platform, which has these three layers on top of each other, um, whereas the other two are just single layers. So even, even though we're, that we've got three platforms, they're not actually very similar to each other. Um, there's this, and it was the same with the structures on the dry land. There was a lot of differences between those. So we tend to, we tend to expect these sorts of things to be the same and they're, they're quite often not. Mm. Um, the next question comes from Bjorn Nielsen, who asks, uh, well, says, thanks, Nikki. And did you succeed in doing dendrochronology of the wooden remains despite compression and decay? Uh, hi, Bjorn. No, sadly, we didn't. We did, we did try. Um, in the, the big birch tree that Clark actually found in the, the trenches, we, we excavated that trench and it was still there. Um, and Alex did take a, a, a section of that to try uh, dendro dating, but sadly um, it wasn't possible. Okay. And um, there are a couple more, if that's right, we're okay for time. Um, so from Maggie Fleming, I think it is, uh, was there any evidence of fishing from example the platforms? And they say, I believe there are platforms in Lake Garda in Northern Italy, that I guess um, we use it that way. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we know they were fishing there because we have we have evidence of fishing from uh, some fish bones. But for, for many years, um, there was a, there was a paper in Journal of Archaeological Science about why were there no fish found at Star Car, um, but we have found some fish bones at, from Star Car. We've also found evidence of processing fish from some of the flint tools that have, uh, where we've done use where. Um, whether they were using the platforms for fishing is really hard to say. I mean, I think the platforms were probably used for stabilizing the muds on the lake edge um, and maybe um, it was possible to, to fish from them, um, but it's, it's, there's, there's no evidence really for what the platforms for used, were, were used for, which is um, very frustrating. That's one of the questions that's uh, been raised from our excavations. So that, that covers a few of the questions, actually. There are quite a few questions about the, um, the platforms. One's just come in as well, which, um, um, which is anonymous, which says something, um, asks whether the platforms were definitely submerged rather than being at the surface. Then think about their potential use and visibility at the time. Well, it's, I mean, we, we did a lot of thinking about this. Um, it's possible that, uh, we, we think that they were very close to the surface. They may have been um, exposed seasonally, uh, perhaps, but if they had been exposed all the time, they obviously would have rotted um, away. So they, um, they, and it's very difficult to measure the, the amount of water that would have been um, over the top of them, but it, we think that they were probably uh, very close to the surface, though, um, yeah, uh, hard, hard to, to be certain or hard to really assess the, the seasonal changes in that. Yeah. And one last question, if that's right, that's coming from Ulla, um, Ulla Rajala, who's asked, what are the flint objects in the bag used? Uh, yes, I think, um, uh, yes, I think they were used for uh, animal, um, processing animal uh, flesh. But uh, we, there's, there's use wear from around the site um, and uh, different kinds of, of, of use wear. And uh, we, with a number of these caches, the, the, the flint has been used before it's been cached as well, interestingly. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Chantal says, yes, almost all for processing animal remains, even very unpromising ones. Thanks, Chantal. <laughs> Thanks, Chantal. 